So I'm going to show you the techniques for a crayon resist watercolor. We are just going to do the boat in this scene in crayon resist and not the horses in this scene because crayon resist involves drawing an outline in white crayon and then painting inside. And if we tried to draw the outline of the horse in crayon, the crayon would be so thick that we wouldn't have any space to get the little horse's legs and things in there. So crayon resist works best when you are drawing big spaces with emptiness in the different areas, which the boat will generally provide for us. So to get our image down onto this piece of watercolor paper to do the crayon resist watercolor, we are going to use the same tracing paper and graphite paper technique that I talked about earlier. If you weren't here for that part, you can go back and watch the video that I made that talks about graphite paper and tracing paper. To briefly summarize, I took the tracing paper onto the source image and I traced it. Tracing paper is simply thin paper. That's its only property or purpose. It's thin paper that you can see through. So I traced the image of the boat with pencil so that now I have this image of a boat on the tracing paper and then you use graphite paper, which is paper that has graphite on one side, which is in essence pencil stuff. And we're going to press the image that we traced down through the graphite paper. And you could do this with a screwdriver or anything else. It's just your, it's the pressure of your uh, action, which is pressing the, the graphite out of the paper and down onto the watercolor paper but we tend to use pencil for this just because it's easier to hold a pencil and to draw with a pencil. So again, it's not that the pencil itself is going through these two layers. The pencil is just acting as a stylus to be able to push the graphite out of the other end. So while we are doing this transfer, we are going to tape the tracing paper down to our destination paper so that it does not move while we were tracing on it so that the image goes through clearly. So since we're going to do a crayon resist watercolor, we are going to do this onto watercolor paper. We'll do this. And we're again, because we're doing crayon resist, we're just going to trace the boat part. And even the boat part might be a little small, but we'll give it a shot. We will see how this works. So when you're doing tracing, it's a good idea to start at one end. Because you can't necessarily tell what you have traced and what you have not traced. So aim to work methodically through your design from one end to another and that way you remember to get all the details. And you don't have to use tracing paper. You can draw this freehand if you want. I'm just showing different techniques for people of different skills and levels. And you can check every once in a while. Make sure your image is transferring properly. Now I'm doing this a little dark so that you can see what I'm doing. When you're doing crayon resist, you generally want to do this light because the fun of the crayon is that it's white and that the lines end up being invisible, blends in with the white of the paper. But it's fine to be able to see 
the crayon lines. All right, so I think I've gotten the entire boat traced. Oh, didn't get that line. That's why it's good to check. <laughs> There we go. Alright, get the scissors. Alright, so we have a tracing of the boat. And then we'll cut it. That this is still quite fine. You could use this over and over and over again to trace new images of the boat. And the graphite paper is barely used. You can still use this over and over again for anything at all. So these things are reusable objects. All right, so the technique for crayon resist watercolors instead of using pen and ink, which we did in the previous one, is to have a white crayon. So the trick with the white crayon is it needs to be reasonably sharp to be able to draw these lines in a sharp way, because you wouldn't want it to have really thick lines because then there wouldn't be any white space. Anywhere that you put the crayon down forms a wax layer that the watercolor won't stick to. And anywhere that there is still watercolor paper showing, the watercolor can interact with in its normal way. So if we want to try to draw these little shutters, we need the, pencil, the crayon to be pointy enough to be able to draw the edges of the shutter and still leave a little spot in the middle for the watercolor to go into. And I think right now with this edge, well, we could use the edges of the watercolor, so, or the uh, crayon. So I think I'll do that. So I want just a little thin edge for these windows so that there is a space in the middle of the shutters for some paint to fit. I do actually have a sharpener over on the side here for the crayons, but when you use a sharpener, you are sharpening away the crayon, of course, and losing crayon. So I try to conserve my art supplies when I can. And if there's a way to do this without having to end up with piles of white crayon shavings that are now unusable in the bottom of a sharpener, that would seem to be a good idea. All right, so using the sh sharp bottom edge of the crayon to draw with so I get reasonably sharp lines along all of these areas. Alright. So because I made these graphite lines so dark, we're still going to be able to see the lines. But in your version, if you make the pencil lines or graphite lines lighter, then you could even erase them out afterwards, depending on how much you put the crayon on top of it, and have a subtler effect. But it's fine to be able to see the lines. Right, part of the trick of doing crayon resist is that it's really hard to tell what you have traced with crayon and what you haven't because it's all white. If you hold it at an angle, you can see glistening where the crayon is. But otherwise, the crayon is white, the paper is white, and it's not exactly clear. Like, I can't quite tell if I did this back line or not, so I'm just going to go over it again. We'll do the front line again. Alright, so I have now traced over the graphite lines with my crayon. And I happen to use the edge of it so I get a nice 
a thin line. But if the point of your crayon is pointy, you can use the tip of the crayon to do that. And that means that now there are wax lines on my paper, and the wax will resist the watercolor from getting to the paper. That's why it's called a crayon resist. So now I'm going to do the background of it, and I'm not going to do the background quite as detailed as this other one because I'm going to just go for a more abstract kind of version of it. So I'm going to take a nice big brush and I'm going to take water to start with. Let me just move this a little more out of the way. Yeah, I suppose it wants to stay there. That is all right. All right, so I'm going to do the entire background with water in this is drying very fast so we'll see if we can even get this all done before it all dries again. So this is wet on wet, wet paper, wet paint, and that means the paint will flow and move throughout this. And that's fine because we're just going with a abstract slash impressionist kind of feel to this painting. And we just want the background to have some green and blue in it to give a general sense that this boat is in water, drifting along past some trees under a blue sky. You'll note the paper is trying to curl because of the way the water is interacting with the paper fibers. So again, this is something where if you wanted to, you could tape it down to the surface that you're working on. Or if you pre-wet it and let it go through that wet and dry cycle, then it tends not to curl quite as much. But I'm just letting it curl. And different weights of paper curl in different ways. Well, see, this is already drying. <laughs> you have to work fast. Depending on your house humidity. Our house is very dry, so it is drying very, very quickly. Sometimes I work on these in stages, like the top half and the bottom half, but today I'm just going for it and do it all. And don't worry about the little hairs that come out of your brush. That is fine. green at the bottom. The forward bank. And again, this is all going to dry lighter than it goes on, so you want to put it on a little darker or be prepared to do a number of layers to be able to get to the color that you're looking for. So green at the forward bank. Blue at the water level. And see how it's like flowing and moving? That's part of the appeal of wet and wet, that it's just going to flow and move and change and it adds to that free kind of aspect to it. All right, we're gonna use a darker green in the background this time. and stuff in the background. See, and the tops are already starting to dry. <laughs> and then the very top is the sky. Now we'll make this color of a sky this time.
sky going in. And again, you can see how it's curling and you can see how the water is getting pearl pulled through the swirls. So you can either accept that as part of the way that your design is, which is what I tend to do, or you can try to mitigate that by taping the paper down or by pre-wetting it or using a different thickness paper or so on. Those are different ways of dealing with these issues. But I like these soft, fuzzy edges between the layers because it gives more of that sense of just a soft background and They're just sort of hills back there. And last time I put in trees and stuff, but this time I don't think I'll even put in that. I'll just go with the general sense of landscape being back there. And all that stuff will merge. Maybe another layer of green on the bottom here. So we get a little bit more color. So you could see how you could put in all sorts of extra layers of detail in the sky and the location and you could put flowers and all that other side of stuff but we're just doing a quick and easy version here keep the blue from spreading quite as much out there so the edges of the boat were drawn with white crayon and that white crayon forms a boundary between these different layers that we're working on. Now crayon is not completely impervious so I wouldn't trust it necessarily to be an absolute layer between things but it does help by giving you some uh, physical boundaries. When we did the one with the pen, the pen doesn't stop the watercolor at all from going places so you have to be fairly detailed with your brush to put things exactly where you want them. In comparison with these having actual wax boundaries against each area it makes a little more likely that what you paint in an area will stay in that area. So here we'll use the smallest brush and we will start from the middle and I think we will do a gray in the interiors of the windows. This has got a hair in it again. So as I'm painting the gray, it comes up against the crayon edges that I put in there, and it will actually stop at the crayon edges. So especially for people who have issues with motor control, either because they're young or they're have other challenges. This is great because I'm putting these windows in and the windows are naturally stopping when they hit that crayon area that I drew. Makes it a little easier for me to have the windows be right where the windows should be. Alright, so on a regular piece of watercolor paper I would have to be careful about painting those squares exactly where I wanted the squares to go. But since I drew on with white crayon, the crayon 
forms a little barrier around the four edges of that. And again, this is something where a parent or guardian or someone with better motor control can draw the initial shape and then can draw the crayon part for the person who has it having challenges. And then the person who has any challenges could sit there and paint it in and be really happy that they are getting their colors into the spots that they belong in because the boundaries have already been drawn for them. Or you can just do it all yourself because I really like the effect it gives that it gives this little crinkly effect around the edges because the wax of the crayon isn't a perfect drawing substance. It's got little bumps and edges that it leaves behind. So it's not a crisp, clean kind of look that the pen and ink tends to give. It's a much softer, gentler kind of look, and I enjoy that. Well, what color should we make this? Red seems to be a popular color for boats, and for good reason, because you generally wouldn't want to do green, because it would just blend in with all the green backgrounds. You generally wouldn't want to do blue, because it would blend in with all the blue of the water and sky. So red is a good color to stand out. I suppose you could do orange. You could do a bright orange. Eh, let's do orange, just to have something a little different. Alright, so we'll get some orange over here. And again, it paints on lighter, so then you would want to put on multiple layers. And the white crayon on the edge creates a resist. So the paint doesn't go right out to the edges. It stops at where that crayon was drawn. to be careful if I get too close to the green because crayon, crayon is not a perfect drawing substance and there can definitely be little gaps and holes in that line so I would not trust it to completely hold back wet paint. So one technique would be to wait until all the paint was dry before working on a different area but since we are on a timed video here. I want to get as much done as I can so you can see how this technique works. A little comment from 1 to 3 p.m. every Saturday afternoon since March. Laura Senadella has been painting amazing oil paintings and she has a library of her videos available for free on Facebook and YouTube. So that's quite a lot of them starting from March. So go ahead and check her out. Laura O and then the last name is C-E-N-E-D-E-L-L-A or if you go to the Blackstone Valley Art Association which is bvaa.org or our Facebook page, Blackstone Valley Art Association, we have links to all of Laura's videos there. So you can also find her easily there with four letters. B as in Blackstone, V as in Valley, A as in Art, A as in Association. So she does her workshops live, so you can ask her all sorts of questions about mixing colors or painting techniques or so on. She happens to paint in oil paints, but you can use the same techniques for acrylics and you can translate the same techniques fairly easily to watercolor. So I have often painted along with her in watercolor while she was painting an oil painting and it's been lots of fun. And she does all sorts of things from still lifes to landscapes to architecture. Lots of fun stuff. The key with art is to just keep trying things. See what you like. Try different things. If you try something and you don't like it, then that is fine. You've learned something. We all like different things. Some of our members like black and white and do everything in black and white. Other of our members love bright colors. 
And that is the beauty of art, that we are all different. We all express ourselves in our own unique manner. So while I'm painting this stripe, the crayon top and bottom of it naturally hold the paint into its place. So it's a helper. And I'll add another layer. The way your paints work also depends what paints you buy. If you buy an inexpensive paint, like I tend to do, then you tend to use more layers because there's not a lot of pigment on each layer. If you buy a very expensive paint, they tend to have more pigment in them, so you might be able to do just one layer and have it nice, be nice, rich, saturated color. What's all well, based on your budget and what you choose. Alright. I guess a gray roof is probably in order. I am a little nervous with everything else being wet around it that this gray is going to spread out into places, but we will find out. We will try to be careful. Normally I would wait for the nearby areas to dry, but we are being quick today so that we get things done. And you can sort of see, or at least I can see maybe because I'm up close to it, that the edges of this gray are running up into that crayon and resisting back against it. So the crayon is doing its job of holding the edges and adding that little crinkly texture to the edges, which I enjoy immensely. All right, All right so we got a gray roof. Gray wit windows. What color should I make the shutters? Uh, let's see what. I'm just going to go Google for a minute. And look at some pictures. Well, it looks like a lot of people use white. I could just leave them white. Well, some people use brown. Brown is pretty. I think I'll go with brown. I don't like just leaving it white like that. Yeah, we'll do orange and brown, like a chocolate brown. All right, so is it just to show how dry it is in the house, that orange is already looking sort of dry, and the gray of the windows is already looking sort of dry. So this is, again, taking a bit of a risk here. <laughs> but we will give it a shot and see if it's dry enough to paint on. So I'll get some chocolate brown. On my brush. Alright, moment of truth. Is this going to stay where I put it or is it going to spread? It looks like it's staying where I put it. Alright, so I am painting on dry watercolor paper in these little shutter areas. 
So in general, it should, should stay where I put it. The challenge is that I'm painting right up against wet all around me, and that wet could easily wick the color right out of the spot and into the neighboring areas. Get a little bit there. Alright, we'll fix that in a second. Let's get the rest of these shutters. Alright, so I'm going to dry, I'm going to rinse the brush off so it's clean. I'm going to dry it. And so now it's a dry brush and I'm going to use it like a little vacuum to vacuum come on, vacuum the color out of that area. There we go. Alright, that chocolate brown is currently not disti distinguishing itself enough from the grays, which just looks sort of like a different gray. So we're going to get a little more chocolate brown on here and go over those spots to darken them up a bit so that they're more clearly brown, not just the gray. There we go. Make them a little more brown like. All right, so you can see in here why it was important to put very thin crayon lines because there had to be enough space for the crayon line between all these little nooks and crannies and still have some empty watercolor paper left in the middle of the little shutter so you could actually put color there. If that all ended up being crayon, then the paint wouldn't stick on it. The paint wouldn't stick to the crayon part. So in general, it's good to do crayon resist with generally large shapes so like the boat but maybe without the shutters or maybe the whole boat would be bigger so that the shutters would be a little larger so something to think about when you're doing crayon resist if I tried to do the little tiny horses I wouldn't be able to draw their legs thin enough to still have space for the paper to show through inside the legs so that's why we didn't do the horses on this one all right let's uh I think I have to turn this sideways a little to be able to get the angle for the brown. And a trait of crayon resist is that you do have these white spaces between your different sections, which is a cool effect. Because we use the graphite paper, you can also see the graphite paper in there. If you did it lighter, then you would barely be able to see the graphite paper in there. If you did it very lightly with pencil, then you could barely see the pencil in there, and it would be more of an effect of just the watercolor with white spaces between them, which you would see through to the paper below. But all of these styles are up to you. It's your artistic decision. I think I just did this as one section, yes. And again, this chocolate brown is going on fairly light, so I will do a second layer to make it the darker chocolatey color that I was aiming for. So these are the basic ideas of a crayon resist watercolor. You draw the basic design out with pencil or graphite. So you could trace it using tracing paper and graphite paper if you want. Or you could draw it freehand with a pencil if you want. And then you trace over those lines with white crayon. So the white crayon blends in with the watercolor paper color while still providing a barrier to the watercolor when you put it down so that it gets stopped on the sides by a sort of crinkly edge and I really like the crinkly nature of that edge.
but while I am painting this, it is running into that crinkly edge of crayon, the white crayon that's in there, and leaving these little gaps. So it creates a unique look to it. So this is especially a fun project to do with kids or people who have motor control challenges, but it's also a lot of fun for uh, all artists because it's a different kind of look and feel to the end result. Alright, so that's a simple image to show you how this works, but you can imagine how to use this in all sorts of other kinds of projects. You can use this for animals. I use this for uh, octopuses and lobsters and other kinds of sea creatures a lot where I draw out the shape with the crayon and then paint in the different colors or sea turtles. You can use this for houses or animals or pretty much anything that you want. It is up to you, but it's just one technique of many. So in this one we learned about wet on wet, which is how we created the very soft, gentle backgrounds. And then we learned on wet on dry, which is this paper was dry that we painted where we can have more detail. And then we learned about crayon resist, which is how we put these edges in so that the paint stayed where we put it. So ask if you have any questions. Here, I will push this up a little so you can see the whole image. Push that that way. All right. I think that you can see the whole image in the square now. Ask if you have any questions about how a crayon resist watercolor works. And thank you for watching this section of the video with me.